Rock and roll was originally a teen phenomenon. The majority of the listeners sucking up that new sound that was being created was around that age. Meaning the chart topping artists was in their late 20s and beyond. The first teenage rock star is a subject of today's story. Many people felt that 13 year old Frankie Lyman and the teenagers helped rejuvenize the music industry of the 50s. Before we get started in today's video, please be sure to leave a like on the video, subscribe to the channel, and push that notification bell to be sure you won't miss out on any more uploads. Now without further ado, let's cue that intro. Franklin Joseph Lyman was born on September 30th, 1942 in Washington Heights, New York. His mother Jeanette was a maid and his father Howard was a truck driver. Frankie, he hailed from a musical family since his parents was members of a gospel group called the Harmonies. His parents would teach their kids on how to sing. Along with Frankie, his two siblings, Louis and Howie, would perform in the gospel group the Harmony Juniors. Timmy, Frankie's brother, was also a singer, but at this time he was doing his own thing. When the Lyman family began to struggle to make ends meet, everyone had to pitch in to help. And at the age of 10, Frankie, he would start working at a neighborhood grocery store, managing cash and making deliveries. The Coupe de Ville's was a local doo-wop for song assistant of black and Puerto Rican kids, led by Herman Santiago, Joe Negroni, Jimmy Merchant, and Sherman Garns. The group, they were singing in the hallways of Garns' apartment building, which was located across the street from the high school. The group, they was already creating their own songs, and most people around the area, they noticed their skill. One day, a neighbor in that building had sent the group a stack of love notes to help motivate them. With Merchant's talent for arranging vocal parts, he would compose of the song, Why Do Birds Sing So Gay? Santiago, he would improve the song by adding certain adjustments. They would sing this song at their school's talent show where they would meet 12-year-old Frankie Lyman. Now, some of the members already knew Frankie from the local grocery store. And like a lot of kids to them, this 12-year-old was extremely aggravating. Frankie, he would spend that spring and summer following around the group begging him to let him join in. Lyman, he was only a month shy from his 13th birthday when the group eventually accepted him. At first, they believed that Frankie, he was too young, which is why they ignored him for so long. But after witnessing his maturity and seeing him perform with his siblings in the talent show contest, they changed their mind. Lyman's strong voice and theoretical presence is what drew people to him. Lyman's voice was so powerful that it was difficult to ignore him. Before Lyman had joined the group, they would change their names to the, the Ermines and the Premiers. Once when Lyman had joined the group, they would change the name again to the teenagers to accommodate everyone's age. Lyman, he was just in eighth grade and the teenagers, they were sophomores when lead singer from the Valentine's, Richard Bennett, had moved into the area and lived in an apartment above the store where Lyman had worked. But Bennett working for G Records, the group, they was acutely aware of the potential that presented itself. Bennett, he was shocked by the group's vocals when they performed for him. And during this time, Santiago and Lyman, they were alternate in taking lead. Bennett, he would arrange for the group to meet with G Records owner George Goldner for an audition. Lyman's voice and confidence had left Goldner speechless at the audition. Goldner was impressed with what he heard and he had urged the group to continue to develop their songs for recording sessions and put Frankie as lead and they would have their self a deal. Frankie's amazing voice to Colonel voice made it clear that he would become the group's front man or in this case I should say front boy. The group made a required modification by including Lyman's name in the title, renaming itself the Teenagers featuring Frankie Lyman. This group impacted so many young vocalists and served as a model for Motown early groups. The group's first recording session began in November with the attentions 
of recording Why Do Birds Sing So Gay? But there was advice that the song title needed to be changed. So the writing credits for this song is quite confusing. However, it is largely known that Santiago and Merchant have wrote the song. Now Lyman, he is credited with altering the song's title to Why Do Fools Fall In Love, which came with a few adjustments to the lyrics to incorporate the song's title which is how Lyman is regarded as a songwriter on this record at the age of 13. Due to their age, their parents will be the ones to sign on to G Records and authorize Goldner as the group's manager. And just after 26 takes, they was finally able to get it right and the song will be officially released. This single gathered the group a lot of attention but has led to several TV appearances. Because of the song's popularity and the fact that they were so young, many people wanted to know who wrote the song. Merchant had stated that all of them played a role, while Goldner stated that Santiago and Lyman wrote the song entirely ignoring what Jimmy had said. With this move, tensions will start to grow between group members. After Goldner had sold G Records to Boris Levy, he would add his name to replace Goldner's. In 57, Levy took over the small label where Frankie Lyman and the teenagers recorded. He also began managing the group. Morris Levy, he was part of the evil element. He was responsible for us being ripped off for the money that the music that we created earned. It is my understanding that uh, Morris was probably the catalyst to separate the teenagers from Frankie Lyman to create two acts. Of course, looking upon Frankie as the, the, the super attraction. In 1956, the group, they were released nine singles with Please Be Mine. Oh, darling, love. I'm not a know-it-all. I love you, baby, and I want you to be my girl. I promise to remember. Who can explain? Oh, who can explain? Just the, moon above the, the ABCs of love. I'll always want you because my heart is true. Come Share. I'm not a juvenile delinquent. No, no. Baby, baby. Baby, baby, how I want you. Baby, baby, how I need you. Baby. The Teenagers featuring Frankie Lyman was the group's debut album. This album was released at the end of 1956. Group's popularity led to them performing on Islands Free, the biggest rock and roll show that featured The Platters, Chuck Berry, Clyde McFadder, Laverne Baker, Bo Diddley, The Drifters, and The Teenagers was among those who appeared on his 81 date tour. Lyman, who was 13 at the time, and Zola Taylor from the Platters, who was 18, became close on this tour. The two first met when Lyman won $1,700 from a fatter in a gambling game, and Taylor, she was intoxicated on scotch, and the two, they would celebrate by having intercourse. As shocking as it may sound, a 13 year old and an 18 year old, Lyman had to grow up quickly. As I already indicated, and as a result, he was quite mature. In a 1967 interview with Ebony Magazine, Lyman would say, I was a man when I was 11 years old, doing everything that most men do. In the neighborhood where I live, there was no time to be a child. During that same interview, he revealed that he knew every prostitute in his area and he would assist them by bringing them customers in exchange for payment. Lyman believed this is where he learned everything that he knows about women. It was also said that around this time, he was pimping out women as young as 10 years old. At first, the group, they was being built as the teenagers featuring Frankie Lyman, which by 1956, they began to build themselves as Frankie Lyman and the teenagers with Lyman's name and large front, while the teenagers was super small. By 1957, the group, they released 10 singles with Teenage Love, as I was going to school one day, I met a cute girl who passed my way. Paper Castles. My Paper Castles. 
Love is a clown. Clown, and I'm a clown to think that she's in love. Am I fooling myself again? Feeling this way. Is it Out in the cold again. You called it our love refrain. Miracle in the rain. A miracle in the rain. That's how we met was a miracle in And everything to me. During the tour in Europe of 1957, Goldner, he began to promote Lyman as a solo performer, even bringing more attention to the group and causing a breaking point. Goldner, he would begin to schedule solo gigs for Lyman and he would release Goody Goody. So he met someone who set you back on your heels. Goody Goody. And Creation of Love. Walked hand in hand. Now these two songs was initially written for the group, but Goldner he kept them for Lyman and he would hire backup vocalists for the records. Lyman, he would formally quit the group by September of 1957. Freshly off the dramatic breakup for the teenagers, Lyman's solo career started off with a decent hit with My Girl. My girl is a natural beauty, my girl. Lyman, he was signed to Roulette Records following the release of this song. Lyman's popularity was at an all-time high, but keep in mind that this was the early 60s and everyone at the time would listen to radios and records. So, when he made a national TV appearance as a solo artist, it left an awkward feeling when the camera panned over to the crowd and we saw the crowd puzzled because they didn't know he was black. I was in love with Frankie. I was in love with Frankie from the time I was 12 years old. And when I heard Why the Fools Fall in Love on the radio, I didn't know if he was black, white. All I knew was he had the greatest voice I'd ever heard. Lyman, he faced even more hostility on the July 19th, 1957 broadcast edition of Alan Freed's The Big Beat, which he would dance with a white woman live on television. Southerners was very outraged, causing a tremendous uproar, and the show was eventually canceled as a result. In 1957, Lyman he would release three additional singles with So Goes My Love. So goes my love for you. Little girl. Little girl. You're the one for me, little girl. And it's Christmas once again. Every voice is raised in singing. That next year, he would release six singles with Thumb Thumb. Well, I'm gonna find you, baby, if I have thumb thumb. Thumb thumb. Footsteps. Hang out on the corner where we used to meet. Portable on my shoulder. A portable on my shoulder and the baby by my side. I got a portable. Mama don't allow it. Mama don't allow it. Only way to love. The only way to love, to love, to love, to love. The only way to love. And Melinda. OG Melinda. You're my Melinda. OG Melinda. In 1960, Lyman, he released three more singles with two covers coming from Bobby Day with Little Bitty Pretty One. And buzz, buzz, buzz. Well, buzz, buzz, buzz goes the bumblebee. goes the bird. But By the early 60s, Lyman, his record sales began to decline sharply, and as a result, his drug habit picked up. Lyman, he became hooked to heroin at the age of 15, which severely harmed his career. In a 1967 interview with Ebony Magazine, Lyman, he stated that he was first introduced to heroin by a woman when he was 15 years old. By that time, drugs was what he was living for. And uh, the only one that could help Frankie was Frankie. But Frankie seemed helpless in the face of his addiction. He still managed to hustle appearances here and there, but by age 20, any chance of reviving his glory days was long gone. He just didn't have the voice. They would have to change the key maybe five notes down and it would sound horrible. 
So when Frankie did things on TV, he would always lip sync towards the end. In 1961, at the age of 19, he would enter rehab. And while tempted to become clean, Morris Levy, he would drop him for Roulette Records. To deal with terrible news on top of bad news, Lyman, he would spend the next few years attempting to become clean, but he kept falling back into heroin. By 1965, Lyman had reunited with the teenagers, but the reunion was a flop. The next year, Lyman, he was looking for another break. With many short-term live contracts with 20th Century Fox Records and Columbia Records. Now, while with 20th Century, he would release to each his own. And Teacher Teacher. And with Columbia, he would release somewhere. Well, just take my hand and follow. And sweet and lovely. My girl, she's so sweet and so lovely. I said she's. Lyman had met and dated Elizabeth Mickey Waters between 1961 and 1964 whom he would marry in January of 1964. The couple, they would have a daughter, but she would sadly pass away two days after delivery. It wasn't discovered until decades later that the marriage was invalid since Waters was illegally divorced from her husband. After Waters and Lyman's marriage had ended, he would relocate to Los Angeles in the mid 60s, where he would resume his relationship with Zola Taylor. The two, they would get married in Mexico, Taylor, she was so in love with Lyman that she allowed Lyman to destroy her home and money, forcing her to move in with her sister after just a few months being together. Years later, it was found out that Taylor's and Lyman's marriage was invalid since they was married in Mexico and they was unable to present the necessary proof. During this time, Lyman, he was still unable to locate a career changing job. And at this time, his drug problem began to get worse. By 1965, he would make his final TV appearance on Hollywood Agogo. Lyman was arrested on a heroin charge on June 21, 1966, and he was enlisted into the United States Army to avoid jail time. Lyman's performance on the Hollywood Agogo television show in 1965 revealed just how far Frankie had fallen. He was missing a tooth, his skin was in bad shape, and he was forced to have to live some. It was sad for most of his fans to, to witness. Soon, Frankie was selling everything he could to finance his habit. Former manager Morris Levy gladly grabbed Frankie's publishing rights to Why Do Fools Fall In Love for a measly 1500 bucks. And then when Frankie's money ran out, the fallen star resorted to petty theft. Lyman, he was stationed at Fort Gordon, Georgia, where he would meet and fall in love with school teacher Armia Eagle, who he would marry in June of 1967. Now, when it comes to his relationship with these ladies, the 1998 film, while the fools fall in love is quite accurate. Lyman would go AWOL for the army to perform at tiny bars, and as a result, he would receive a dishonorable discharge. He was formally moved in with his wife after being discharged and was living a clean life, even returning to church. Lyman, he would meet manager Sam Bray by visiting New York, who sold him on a dream and signed him to Big Apple Records. Lyman would opt to move in with his grandmother in Harlem after booking a recording session for February. Heroin would be used one more time to celebrate his good fortune and finding his way back into the industry after being completely clean for two years. Lyman was only 25 years old when he would pass away from a heroin overdose on February 27, 1968. In 1966, Lyman landed in front of a judge who made the 24-year-old farmer phenom an offer he couldn't refuse. He was given the choice to get off the streets or we gonna, you know, put another kind of uniform on you. While he was in the army, he was stationed in Augusta, Georgia, and he met a woman there who was a school teacher who he felt could help to turn his life around. And that woman was Myra Eagle, who became his wife. Frankie and Amira tied the knot on June 30th, 1967. For a while, it looked like marriage in the military had the former child star singing a new tune. When I met Frankie, 
there was no sign of drug use when I when I, he was with me. We discussed this, and I, and I told him that I would not put up with it. But being on stage was one drug Frankie couldn't give up. He entertained around here in nightclub part time. Whenever he would go out to sing, people ask him to do, hey, Frankie, what about doing How Why Do Fools Fall In Love? He tried, but he could no longer do that. So he, it was kind of frustrating to him also at that point. By February of 1968, after only eight months of marriage, 26-year-old Lyman was itching for one more shot at the big time. Frankie went to New York uh, because his manager called him. He had a weekend job, so he did not want to go by himself. He didn't want to leave me. Maybe the singer knew what was waiting for him. Lyman was drawn back to New York by his obsession to perform, but in the end, his other obsession took over. I often wonder if he had not elected to try to come back to New York and try to, to re-energize his career, if um, somehow he would still be with us. I've often said over the years that if Frankie were still with us today, he would have been our generation's Sammy Davis Jr. Lyman was discovered dead in his grandmother's bathroom, holding a syringe. Years after his death, Diana Ross had made his name relevant again with her version of his most famous tune, Why Do Fools Fall In Love in 1981. Lyman's inheritance sparked a significant debate because he technically never divorced for any of his wives. The entire route of his estate had inspired the 1998 film, Why Do Fools Fall In Love? Now, an interesting fact about this film is that before Lorenz Tate was casted as Lyman, singer Ronnie Dyson was highly considered. Frankie Lyman and the Teenagers, they was inducted to the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame in 1993 and the Vocal Group Music Hall of Fame in 2000. Now, although the group's fame was limited, a series of accomplishments had impacted numerous of rock and R&B performers. The girl group sound is thought to be a direct descendant of Lyman's high vocal sound. Many vocalists was influenced by Lyman, including Michael Jackson, Diana Ross, The Chantels, The Temptations, and Smokey Robinson, among many others. 